service here tonight at the Tron Church, and uh, you're particularly welcome you're visiting uh, with us. Let me begin by reading some words from the scriptures. Our God, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. He rules the kingdom of men. Well, we begin by singing a song that picks up that theme of our great God, the King of the universe, number 249, King of the universe, Lord of the ages, maker of all things, sustainer of life. Let's sing together, 249. as we sit, let's gather our hearts and pray to our Father. Let's pray. Father, we're reminded as we've sung these words that you are the supreme and sovereign Lord. You are the King of the universe. And that is a great comfort to know that you are on the throne, that all things are ultimately directed by you and according to your purposes. So help us this evening to humbly submit to your ways. How easily we sometimes box you in, limit you. Think of you as somehow being a small God at our beck and call. Remind us of your greatness. 
your universal power, your perfect love and abounding grace. And so help us, knowing that, to be a people that listen to you and to listen to you as you've revealed yourself in your word. And give us certainty about your plans and your purposes for your world and how we, your creatures, your people, are to align with and submit to your plans. So help us, Lord, to that end, that we would be your willing servants, glad and joyful and willingly serving you with all our lives. So help us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, you're very welcome here this evening at our service here at the Toronto Church. Uh, no doubt there'll be some visitors with us tonight as we have uh, a baptism and uh, new folk joining the church. So if you're visiting with us tonight, you're particularly welcome, and uh, we're looking forward to meeting you a bit later on in the service. I think there'll be tea and coffee served at the end, so please do stay, and uh, we'd love to get to know you a bit. There should be, uh, on the way in, you should have had some of the notices for this week in our little notice sheets, so do be using that uh, for the week ahead, just seeing what's going on in the life of the church. Uh, just one thing to mention, and that's our prayer meeting on Wednesday night, 7.30, and that's here as we gather to pray for the work of the Lord's people. So do use that. It details all that's going on in the life of the church for the week ahead. Good. Well, we turn now to God's Word, and we're in the book of Acts this evening, and uh, we are resuming a little series we began last summer in the book of Acts, and we'll be spending the next six or seven weeks uh, working through uh, the next little section. And tonight we're in Acts chapter 6, and reading from verse 8. If you're using one of the Vista Bibles, that page uh, 914, to so Acts chapter 6, and I'll read from verse 7, which is really a summary of the previous uh, six chapters. So I'll read from chapter 6 and verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. For they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him up before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners of the land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him 
and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem, and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamer in Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, until there arose over Egypt another king, who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race, and forced our fathers to expose their infants, so that they would not be kept alive. At this time... Moses was born, and he was beautiful in the sight of God, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand. But they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he drew near to look there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning, and I've come down to deliver them. And now... Come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent both as a ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who is in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship to the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me to me slaying beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness of the house of Israel. You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Raphan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness 
just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. And so it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of the Lord and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who made and built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by the angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well done. That was a long reading. Good. Well, we turn now and again into our hymn books, and we sing number 894, Come, O Fount of Every Blessing, Tune My Heart to Sing Your Grace, Streams of Mercy Never Ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise, number 894.
Good. Well, the uh, offering for the Lord's work uh, will now be uplifted. Uh, the musicians will play as that's going on. And you may want to look again at those words we just read from Acts chapter 6 and 7, which we'll be thinking about a bit later on. But the offering will now be received. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you give to us, our daily bread, our every breath, and supremely in Christ, forgiveness from sin, and life everlasting. And so we pray that these small gifts we've given as well as our time and talents, that you would use them for your purposes and for the glory of your name. And now as we come to your word in a moment, Lord, what we know not, would you teach us? What we are not, would you make us? And what we have not, would you give us? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we sing the hymn on the screens uh, as we come now to God's word. So let's sing together now in reverence and awe. We gather round your word.
Good. Well, please do turn back to the passage we read earlier in Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7. We'll spend a few moments now thinking about this together. Acts chapter 6 and 7. Let me begin with a question. What are you prepared to die for? What are you prepared to die for? I wonder if, as you read this passage earlier, that you thought to yourself, what a waste. What a waste of a talent to see Stephen, such a key man in the early church, to see him martyred. What a waste. Surely he didn't have to die. Well, was it? Was his death a waste? Well, Luke, the writer of this account, he's included this section in his book to give us clarity and certainty about the gospel and how it goes forward in the world. Stephen had clarity and certainty, which is why he was willing to die. He was clear about the gospel. He was clear about the fact that it provokes. He was clear about the content of the gospel, but also that this gospel that he was willing to die for, he was clear that it was going to the ends of the earth. Nothing was going to stop that. And this passage, and it's a long one, it's here to give its readers, to give you and I, certainty and clarity. Remember that Acts is the second part of Dr. Luke's account of the words and works of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an account with a clear purpose, a purpose that's set out in the very first pages of his gospel, his gospel account. Let me read you those words as he introduces his Luke-Acts account. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, they've delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. Luke writes an orderly account to give certainty. So taking gospel acts as Luke's single work, we can say, to quote one preacher, that he is writing so that we will have certainty about what Jesus has done and is doing, and also that we'll have certainty about the way in which Jesus is working now through his church. That's what this is here for. And in the opening chapters of Acts, which you looked at last summer, chapters 1 to 6, we read about the beginning of the continuation of the works of the risen Lord Jesus as his apostles witnessed to his death and resurrection. And chapter 6, verse 7, which I read at the start, that gives us a summary of this first section, that the word of God continued to increase, the numbers of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That's what's been happening so far. And our passage that we read earlier, it marks the beginning of the next stage of the gospel advance. And this chapter is a real turning point. Up until this point, the focus has been entirely on Jerusalem. But by the end of our passage this evening, things have moved on. Look on to chapter 8, verse 1. There was great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And look on to verse 4. What were they doing? Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So the events of our passage, they lead directly to the further spreading of the gospel. That is what is so significant about these words we've read. So we'll look at this passage under three headings. Three things we learn about the great, unstoppable gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So first, at the end of chapter 6, verses 8 to 15, God's great gospel mission provokes. God's great gospel mission provokes. We're given certainty about the impact of the gospel. 
Already in the opening pages of Luke's account, we've seen the steady opposition to the progress of the gospel from those outside the church and also attempts from within the church to undermine that progress. And so far, it's been the apostles that have borne the brunt of that opposition. Think about Peter and John in chapter 4 being dragged before the council. But here in chapter 6, it's not an apostle who's in the firing line, but rather it's Stephen. He was one of the men appointed by the apostles in the first half of chapter 6. He's a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And he was, verse 8, doing great wonders and signs among the people. And he drew out opposition, end of verse 9, because they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And by including this episode, Luke is demonstrating clearly that opposition to the gospel is not just directed at the apostles. No, the gospel in its very essence brings opposition, regardless of whose lips it comes from. God's great gospel mission provokes. Just look at how the members of the synagogue of the freedmen react to the words and works of Stephen. They did not like one bit what they heard, and they took him to task. But they couldn't withstand the wisdom with which he spoke. They weren't able to counter the truth that he uttered. And so they have to resort to underhand tactics. Look at verse 11. They secretly instigated men who said, we've heard him speak blasphemous words about Moses and God. They stirred up trouble, and eventually he's dragged before the council. False witnesses testify against him. It's pretty grim, isn't it? But this is a reality that Luke is really clear on. The gospel provokes opposition. It's the reality. But it's not in any way surprising. In fact, it's entirely to be expected. Back in the first half of his account, Luke records these words spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. So those are words recorded by Luke, spoken by Jesus. And his words are proving to be exactly true here, aren't they, in chapter 6 of Acts. It's exactly like Jesus said it would be. And so Luke is giving us, he's giving you and I certainty about the reality of what the gospel provokes. And sometimes, sometimes the gospel provokes real, stern opposition. Opposition that leads those who declare the truth about Jesus being dragged before councils. But that's just how Jesus said it would be. And so we're not to be surprised or scared by that. He's in absolute control. And he gives his words, his servants, the exact words to say in such moments. Back in Luke, just after the bit I quoted a minute ago, Jesus goes on to say this. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And don't we see a wonderful fulfillment of those very promises here with Stephen? He's given just the words. The Lord was with him. And this helps us. This little section here at the end of chapter 6 it gives you and I real realism. It helps you and I to be realistic about the impact that the gospel has. Yes, of course, some will gladly accept. Just look back two verses to chapter 6, verse 7. We read there about some in Jerusalem, some of the priests are becoming obedient to the faith. So from some, there's great and glad acceptance. But here, in the same city, there are other Jews who fiercely oppose the gospel. And so you and I need to be realistic about that. But we're not fatalistic. It's just as Jesus said it would be. He's in control. And so you and I, we may very well face stern opposition like Stephen. 
we may be dragged before councils facing the same opposition that he faced and that before him Jesus faced. We're to be realistic, but also we're to be reassured. We see with Stephen's example and with the promise of the Lord Jesus that if we do face opposition, we have everything we need to stand firm and to witness faithfully to the end. The very same Holy Spirit that equipped and enabled Stephen indwells every Christian. And so we are to walk with him obediently, day after day. And as Kevin DeYoung puts it, you can't plan for persecution. But if you walk with Jesus now, you can speak for Jesus then. We can be greatly reassured as we walk with him now, he'll equip us, he'll be with us. He'll give us the words to say then. So God's great gospel mission, it provokes. We're given certainty about the impact of the gospel. So you and I are to be realistic, but also reassured. Let's look on now to our second point, and it's chapter 7, verses 1 to 53. God's great gospel mission, his great gospel message is proclaimed. God's great gospel message proclaimed. We're given certainty about the content of the gospel. Stephen's accusers, they make two false accusations against him there in chapter 6, verse 13 and 14. The two accusations are this. One, that Stephen has been speaking against the temple. And second, that he has spoken against the law as delivered by Moses. And Stephen's response is extraordinary. It's long. It's the longest speech recorded in the book of Acts. And he rehearses much of the history of God's people, starting with Abraham, and then Joseph, and then Moses, briefly mentioning Joshua, then David, Solomon, and then ultimately, the righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And through the course of his speech, Stephen flips their accusation right back on them. The accusation against Stephen was that he spoke against Moses, that he was against the Scriptures. But the truth, however, was that he spoke against the Jews' interpretation of Moses. His contention was that they had consistently misunderstood the meaning of their own Scriptures, particularly with regard to the Messianic prophecies. And so Stephen sets about demonstrating to them what the scriptures are really all about and that they've understood it all wrong and that their scriptures have now been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's basically saying to them, your God, the God that you worship, he's too small. You stop listening to him. And just look at his conclusion there in verse 51. It's extraordinary, isn't it? No punches are pulled. Verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. No punches pulled. Stephen's speech, it's all about the great and majestic God. It's all about how he works and how he has brought his plans and purposes to fulfillment and fruition in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stephen proclaims God's great gospel message. So let's consider his speech under two points. He says to his accusers, you've limited God and therefore you haven't listened to him. So first, you've limited God. Stephen sets out a massive vision of God and his majestic glory. And it's in total contrast to the small God of his opponents. You see, those Jews he was speaking to, they had limited God to a particular place, to the temple. That's what they get so angry about. They say, you're speaking against this place, about the temple. But Stephen, look at verse 49, he knows that God is far, far bigger than that. Heaven is my throne. The earth, that's my footstool. So Stephen really takes on his listeners 
and he declared to them that God cannot be localized in some building. God is not limited to a temple. Now, Stephen covers an awful lot of geography in his speech. I wonder if you noticed that as we read. Just look at all the places that he mentions. Look at verse 2. He talks about Mesopotamia and Haran. In verse 4, he talks about the land of the Chaldeans. In verse 9, he talks about Egypt. Verse 10, Egypt. Verse 11, Egypt and Canaan. Verse 16, Shechem. Verse 17, Egypt, and so on and so on. Lots and lots of geography. And so for someone who likes maps, as I do, this is great stuff. You can get really lost in all the geographical detail. But Stephen isn't interested in geography for the sake of geography. Why mention all these places? Well, Stephen is demonstrating that God is not limited to a particular place, to a particular piece of land, or to a particular building. So many of the places he mentions here are not in the promised land. Abraham, Moses, Joseph, they never lived in the promised land. So this is not to say that the promised land is insignificant, far from it. But God isn't limited by it. He's not limited to one place. He's not limited to a tent or a temple. The Most High does not dwell in houses made by man. He's the God of the universe, not just Israel. How could the God of the universe be restricted to some temple in Jerusalem? His plans and purposes were never limited to a small parcel of land in the Middle East. It was always the plan of God for his kingdom and presence to be extended to the ends of the earth. Even back in the Garden of Eden, that was the instruction given to Adam and Eve. Go to the ends of the earth, subdue it. The world was always in view. And with the coming of the Lord Jesus, all that was anticipated in the Scriptures comes to its glorious fruition. Jesus has now come. The temple is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. It's no longer constricted to a place. It's a person. And it's one who rules over the entire universe. Now, do we see just how devastating Stephen's line of argument is? The Jews literally had God boxed in, contained, limited. It seems silly, doesn't it, to think that the sovereign God, the creator of the universe, to think that he could be contained and limited. The promised land was his, yes. But so was every square inch of the entire earth. It always belonged to him. You can't contain him. Now, I wonder if your view of God is a bit like that of the Jews that Stephen was speaking to. I wonder if you think you can compartmentalize God, limit him. But he cannot be limited. He cannot. He doesn't dwell in houses made by man. And you see, if you limit God... If you restrict him to a temple or a building, if you limit him, then you don't really need to listen to him. And that's the second key point in Stephen's speech. He says to them, you haven't listened to God. In his survey of Israel's history, Stephen highlights not just geography, not just where God is located or where he blesses, but he also highlights that the Jews have constantly refused to listen to God's words and to God's messengers. That was always the way it was with Joseph, with Moses. Constant rejection and opposition from the people of God against God's appointed rescuers and mouthpieces. God's people have always, says Stephen, limited God. And so by limiting him, there's no real requirement to listen to him. And that is what God's people have done in the past, says Stephen. It's what those who are speaking to have done. It's what so many do today. If you limit God, you don't have to listen to him. But Stephen blows that thinking clear out of the water. You cannot limit God. You must listen to him. Listen to his messengers. And supremely, you must listen to Jesus, who is the final messenger, the great deliverer, the supreme rescuer. 
And as Stephen says, the Jews had at all times rejected their God-appointed deliverers and had simply summed up all their previous history in rejecting the one whom God had long promised, the one whom all these deliverers had foreshadowed. They rejected him ultimately. That is what he says there in verse 52. They murdered him, they betrayed him. Let's quickly trace the examples that Stephen gives in his speech of their rejection time and time again of God's deliverers and rescuers. Look at Joseph, verse 9. The patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, they sold him into slavery. And Joseph would prove in the end to be their redeemer, wouldn't he? And then on to verse 25, Moses. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling. He tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the men who were wronging his brother said, Who made you the ruler and judge over us? And Moses again, end of verse 38. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him. They thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt. And then there's the clincher in verse 51. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have betrayed and murdered. Stephen turns the whole thing around on his accusers. They are the ones who are in the dark. Because they, as their forefathers did, they've refused to listen to God's messengers. In fact, they've done more than that. They've done more than refused to listen. They have, in fact, killed Jesus Christ, they murdered him. And a refusal to listen to God's messengers, and in particular for us who live this side of the cross, a refusal to listen to God's final messenger, his own son, Jesus Christ, that is culpable. It's serious. Eternal destinies hang in the balance. That is why Stephen was prepared to die. Recognition of God's appointed Savior, bowing knee to him, recognizing him, listening to him, well, that leads to deliverance and life. A failure to acknowledge Jesus can only lead to judgment and death. That's Stephen's assessment of those he's speaking to. And so that assessment, well, it's deeply offensive, isn't it? For these accusers to be told, you're opposing God. To be told that they are totally wrong. To be told that as it stands, they are no better than unbelieving Gentiles. It cuts them to the heart, and they hate him for it. And that's no different today. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it calls all people in all places at all times to listen to him because he is God's final messenger. He's God's final deliverer and salvation can only be found in him. And so if you haven't repented, if you've not turned to him for forgiveness, then you must. And that is not a comfortable truth to be told. It wasn't then and it isn't today. Stephen's message is the eternal gospel message. It turned his accusers' assumptions and understandings totally upside down. They had it all wrong, and they hated him for it. Which leads to our final point. Despite that opposition, despite that murderous opposition, the gospel progresses. So we see from chapter 7, verse 54, to the beginning of chapter 8. You see, God's great gospel movement progresses. We're given certainty about the spread of the gospel. You see, gospel expansion 
and gospel persecution. They ironically work together. And this is what Luke demonstrates again and again. We see it so vividly here. Those who Stephen was speaking to, they are absolutely enraged. They drag him out of the city and they stone him to death. You see, their sin had been exposed. Their savior had been revealed. But they wanted none of it. They didn't want to hear it. They literally put their fingers in their ears, verse 57. They run at Stephen. And it's a terrible and grotesque scene, isn't it? But look at what happens next. Chapter 8, verse 1. Saul, he approves of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, up until this point, as we've seen, the activity has been all in Jerusalem. But there was still more to be done. Remember Jesus' words from Acts chapter 1. He charged his apostles with the task of being his witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but to Judea and to Samaria and then to the end of the earth. That was Jesus' mission plan for his apostles. This great expansion of the gospel is unstoppable. That's the big picture of the book of Acts. And the severe persecution, the martyrdom we read about here, it didn't stop the spread of the gospel. In fact, it was the very means to the spread of the gospel, wasn't it? It's just how it was for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luke is careful here to draw a close comparison between the Lord Jesus and Stephen. The sufferings and death of Stephen are so like the sufferings and death of Jesus. And that is the pattern. That is the pattern of all who follow Christ and witness to him. Those who follow Christ, you and I, if we follow Christ, we are called to take up our cross. We're called, if it comes to it, to die for our faith. Now, without doubt, as James Phillip put it, the persecution was the work of Satan, but it became the means of God in God's hands. It became the new outreach of his grace. And he goes on to say that this ought to help us see Satan's attacks and press on our lives in proper perspective. Stephen had that perspective. And it was a perspective that saw beyond the temporal. It saw beyond what he was experiencing to eternity. It's remarkable, isn't it? Look at verse 56. He saw the risen Lord Jesus standing in heaven. And as he dies, in verse 59, he calls out to Jesus. And having this amazing perspective, seeing the Lord Jesus there, the risen Lord Jesus in heaven, that enabled him to suffer with such dignity and to even ask for the forgiveness of those who are stoning him. That is the only way you and I can endure suffering in this world, isn't it? Knowing there's an eternity knowing that there's the Lord Jesus Christ waiting for us to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Without that eternal perspective, we couldn't stand. But that is, the, that is the perspective. Knowing that there's something beyond this world. But notice a small detail at the end of verse 1. There's a great persecution. Many are scattered, except the apostles. And it seems that the apostles remain, at least initially, in Jerusalem. They were the leaders of the Jerusalem church, and they stayed. And so it is the ordinary Christians, the non-apostles, who are scattered. It's the non-apostles who go about preaching the word. Those are the people we read about there in chapter 8, verse 4. They are the ones who go about preaching. And the task of gospel spread, that is the responsibility not of the few, but of the many. 
It's not the task of the preacher alone. It wasn't the task of the apostles alone. It's not the task of the elders alone or the small group leaders or whoever. It's the task of every Christian. Wherever you go, wherever I go, whether it's at home or in the workplace, the classroom, over the garden fence, wherever there are Christians witnessing to the truth about Jesus, that is our task. We are to go with the words of Christ on our lips, proclaiming Christ. But it is a task that may well mean for us, for you, for me, real costliness and opposition and suffering. But that is the pattern that we see here. It was Stephen's own experience. But it was so, it was his experience because it was first Jesus' experience. And that is the pattern for all who will follow him and speak for him. But that is the pattern of gospel growth. Gospel expansion and gospel persecution, they work together. So if we meet hard times as a church, as individuals, don't panic. That is how God grows his church. And it is going to the ends of the earth, just as Jesus said it would. Nothing is going to stop that. We have certainty that God's great gospel message provokes. We have certainty about God's great gospel message that we're to proclaim. But we also have certainty that God's great gospel movement progresses. Nothing will stop that. Let's be encouraged. Let's pray. Our Father, you know how weak and how feeble and how faint-hearted we so often are. Encourage our hearts with these words to see that you are in control, that you are taking your great gospel to the ends of the earth. And so would you help us to see things through the eyes of an eternal perspective, seeing beyond the sufferings and persecutions of this world to the eternity beyond. So comfort us, encourage us, and strengthen us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in a moment, we're going to be welcoming new folk into the church and also baptizing uh, Jackie. But before we do that, we're going to sing number 632, we have a gospel to proclaim, good news for all throughout the earth. Number 632.
Well, now, welcome. Welcome to you guys up at the front. And uh, welcome to this point in the service when we're going to be uh, hearing professions of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, admitting these brothers and sisters at the front here to membership of our uh, congregation. Uh, we have a number of folk joining this evening. It's a smaller number than usual. This is an extra before the summer holidays. We had a membership service just quite recently, but there were a number of folk who missed. And so uh, we're very delighted this evening to be welcoming our uh, brothers and sisters here. Uh, first of all, before we go uh, further, we're going to have uh, a baptism. Jackie Barnett has asked for uh, Christian baptism. And so uh, we're going to do that now. But before we do, I'm just going to explain uh, a little about what that means. Some of you are here this morning and heard some of that explanation uh, already. But for some of you, this might be new and uh, we want to be not just uh, performing rituals, but making it very clear what it is, what it's all about, and what it signifies. So let me just remind you. The sacrament of baptism was instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ before he ascended to heaven and after he was raised from the dead. And he said these words to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. And you therefore go and make disciples of all nations. What does that mean? Well, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them therefore to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's just what we've been reading about and hearing about this evening, the beginnings of that commandment being played out and being fulfilled by the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, making disciples and teaching them to obey all that the Lord Jesus commanded the apostles. And what Jesus is talking about there is the fulfillment of the promises of the prophets of old. They told of a day at last and longed for a day when through the coming of the Christ, the Messiah, of Israel, God would do a new thing for all the peoples of the earth, establishing a new covenant, an everlasting covenant, and drawing people from every tribe and language and people and nation to rejoice along with the uh, natural seed of Abraham who believed and rejoiced in Christ as the Messiah, to join with them in the true Israel of God that is, a people who are cleansed and renewed by the grace of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about prophets like Ezekiel, who spoke of that day and said, in that day I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean. And I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, the commandments of God through our Lord Jesus so no longer is the sign of belonging to God's household a mark in the flesh, the mark of circumcision that divided Jew and Gentile. Paul says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision now counts for anything. What counts is a new creation in Christ. And he says, as many as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that means that our identity is in Christ alone. It's through faith in him alone. Because he's the fulfillment of everything that the law and the prophets spoke of and pointed to. Just as we've been hearing tonight, that was Stephen's message, wasn't it? Explaining the truth of it. And so this sacrament of baptism is a sign and a seal of that fulfillment of God's covenant of grace. It's a sign of our engrafting into Christ. It's a sign of forgiveness of sins for all who trust in him through the sprinkling of his blood, through the regeneration that we receive, through the pouring out of his Holy Spirit, with the adoption that we receive through him into the promise of everlasting life. So, Christian baptism, therefore, testifies that all these repetitive washings and sprinklings of the Old Testament time, that all of that has now been accomplished in Christ. 
Hebrews in chapter 9 puts it this way. If the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of bulls and goats sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will the sprinkling of his blood purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And that's why Peter says, baptism now saves you. Not as, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. It doesn't mean through our appeal to God. He means the appeal of the risen Lord Jesus Christ to God, who says, by my death and my resurrection, my people are cleansed forever. And so baptism preaches to us. It preaches to us visibly the true gospel of Christ. It says to us that everything God has promised from the beginning of his story has now been fulfilled once and for all in the finished work of Christ. And it's a visible word to remind us that it's in Christ and it's in Christ alone, no one else and in nothing else, that all of our hope is found. Nothing else is needed Indeed, nothing else is possible. Just the grace of God poured out to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this sign of pouring out of water is all about. Just like when we gather around the table of the Lord and sharing the Lord's Supper, it points us back to the cross once and for all. So this pouring out of the water points us back once for all to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where his blood was poured out, shed for us, and for our salvation. So Jackie, would you come up here and, and join me? And it's a great joy and delight to have you here this evening. And I want to just put these questions to you. Do you confess your faith in God as your heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? And do you repent of your sins and with a humble and contrite heart put your trust in the mercy of God, which is in Jesus Christ alone? Well, with great joy, therefore, I'm glad to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Would you kneel here before us? Jackie. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Do stand. Jackie, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And with great joy, we witness your baptism here this evening. Come down now and stand uh, here. And let me introduce the others who uh, are with you here at the front uh, this evening. We have, um, well, we have a number of folk who uh, are joining us this evening who are not able to be here. First of all, just let me, uh, I'll go through the, the uh, names. You have them on the sheets there, so not to be confusing, I'll go in the, uh, in the order. Becky Amflit's not here, but you regularly see Becky sitting here playing the violin. She's uh, a master's student at the uh, conservatoire uh, in violin, well, particularly in, in uh, fiddle music. And uh, she had to be away this weekend, but we're delighted to be welcoming uh, uh, Becky to join us here. She's very much part of the fellowship already. Jackie, you've already met, so she's been baptized uh, with us. Jackie's a regular at uh, the nine o'clock service at Kelvin Grove, and uh, we're just delighted, Jackie, to be welcoming you this evening. Phil Green is, uh, again, sadly not able to be with us this evening. Phil is shortly to be married to Abby Rose, who's been a member with us here for some time. But um, Phil's father, who is a friend of mine, a doctor in Aberdeen, is, uh, is very unwell at the moment, he begins chemotherapy for a very serious uh, cancer treatment just this week and fills up with his parents this weekend and has felt it was right to stay on uh, to help them. But we welcome very warmly Phil and uh, we 
uh, I'm sure we'll want to be praying for him and for his, uh, his family, particularly at this time. Then we have Andy and Lydia, Andy and Lydia Hazel, who have been with us also for some time. Uh, Andy works in the police and uh, Lydia uh, in education, and uh, they also come along to the Kelvin Grove uh, Fellowship. And uh, Andy and Lydia, it's lovely to welcome you this evening. We're delighted to welcome you into uh, our fellowship. Rose, now Rose, Rose has joined us fairly recently, uh, all the way from, well, not quite directly, but originally all the way from Egypt via uh, uh, England. And uh, Rose is a lecturer at the University in Glasgow here. And Rose, we're really delighted to, to welcome you and that you find fellowship in the, uh, in the Tron Church uh, here with us. And, uh, oh, I missed you out, Brendan, sorry. Well, yeah, I'm very sorry to miss you out. But Brendan is, um, you're probably used to being missed out because you're way out there in the, in, the, in the sea in one of those islands. The island of Harris is where uh, Brendan comes from. But he's come to civilization. And uh, he, having been an undergraduate in Aberdeen, is a, a postgraduate studying medical, is that right? Medical, not medical illustration. What is it? Medical visualization. Medical visualization. There you are. And uh, he's uh, been with us here for this year. And uh, Brendan, it's great to have you with us. And he's going to be working for the Navigators uh, from the, the summer onwards. And uh, we're delighted he's still to be with us. Uh, I hope I'm getting this right now. Yes, last but not least, Anne Shilliday. Anne also is, is, uh, had to be away uh, this weekend, but we're delighted to welcome uh, Anne also. All of our brothers and sisters here and those that we've mentioned who are not here uh, have uh, been with us for some time, have uh, been interviewed by uh, some of the pastors and elders of our church here um, who are gladly satisfied with their Christian profession and are glad to give them opportunity this evening to stand before us all publicly um, and to profess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to confess that faith and to commit themselves to serving the Lord Jesus with our church here. And that's no small thing because if you look around, we are quite a motley crew. I'm not sure I'd want to join this church if I wasn't in it already. I'm sure many of us wouldn't want to join it either. But uh, we're a very ordinary group of the Lord's people. Wasn't that encouraging to hear what Paul was saying? That the great advance of the gospel of Christ happened not just through the apostles, but through the ordinary people of the Lord Jesus scattered about the world, sharing his faith and sharing his message. And that's what we are here committed to do. And it's a great encouragement to all of us that you want to join with us and you're willing to publicly associate with us and you're willing to take up uh, your mantle along with us and to serve the Lord Jesus here. And that's a great encouragement to us. And we hope that as you stand here tonight before us all, it's a great encouragement to you uh, also. But I want to put to you these questions, these membership vows, and they're all in the sheets that everybody has uh, in front of them. I'm going to ask the whole congregation here to stand because as our new members here take these vows uh, on their lips... We are all who are members of the church here being reminded of what we also have committed ourselves to, what we also at some stage have promised the Lord and promised one another. And so in a very real sense, we're all taking these vows afresh with you uh, this evening. Nevertheless, as we stand, I'm going to put these to you uh, all together. And after each one, if you agree, if you could answer in the affirmative, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Now, do you promise then to join regularly with your fellow Christians here in worship on the Lord's Day? Do you promise to be faithful in reading the Bible and in prayer? Do you promise to give a fitting proportion of your time, your talents, and your money for the church's work in the world. And finally, do you promise, depending on the grace of God, to confess Christ before men, to serve him in your daily work, and to walk in his ways all the days of your lives? May the Lord bless you and enable you faithfully to keep your promises. And the God, <clears throat> the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, may he indeed confirm you by his Spirit, that you may be established in his covenant and be blameless on the day of his coming. 
As we stand together, let's pray. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And if anyone would come after me, said the Lord Jesus, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. So, Lord, we ask earnestly but trustingly that you will help our brothers and sisters here and indeed help all of us to be faithful to all that we have promised you and all that we have promised one another, that we may be found faithful servants and soldiers of our Lord Jesus Christ and blameless and with great joy on the day of his coming. So hear us and help us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus, the only king and head of this church, and by the authority of the leaders of our church, the session here, I now admit you to membership and to fellowship of our congregation, to the fellowship of the Lord's table, and to partnership in the gospel with all of us here. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. For you, and the same goes for all of us. As we remain standing, we're to sing together our last hymn, which you'll find at number 628. And uh, I think it's on the screen here, so you may not need your books. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's pray. May the God of endurance and encouragement 
grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.